Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Simon, for the introduction, and welcome, everyone. Um, Simon, I actually have. I'm prepared to have my uh, show my web camera if that's going to help. If people would prefer to see my face while I'm talking, or if you know from experience over the last couple of days, if that's not really adding any particular benefits, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, up, Sam, up, as long as you're dressed, I would be delighted for you to show the webcam. It'd be okay. great, Adam. So, let's have a look and see how this. Um, Wrong camera, so uh, give me a second here. Let's go to uh, camera. <clears throat> there you go. So different camera. Here we go. That should work. There we go. There we are. All oh, right. that's great. Good. Um, cool, 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 cool. So there we go. I can just adjust a little bit and then show you. So yeah. Um, hi everyone, and uh, I've obviously just got this in. I don't want to, the, the audio from my laptop is a bit terrible. Um, and this is really just uh, meant to be an additional thing in addition to the slide. So if it becomes a bit of a hindrance, then I will just uh, kind of put it out the way. All right. Um, all right. So uh, Simon, yeah, I've got probably an hour's worth of content here, and, and I, I've got 25 slides, and then I want to go to the markets and have a look at a few different things. So I'll I'll be keeping an eye on the clock, and then you can just kind of guide me as uh, as to kind of if you need me to speed up or slow down or whatever because i i'm pretty sure everybody is very tired um it would be you would have just i mean people can be tired after one of my webinars because it's, it's quite a brain dump of uh, information and therefore uh it can be quite exhausting it's a lot to take in so people can get quite tired um, all right, so I'll just carry on. Um, uh, basically, the topic for what I'm going to be talking about tonight is the trader's journey, and which is how to achieve consistency in technical trading. Um, and uh, obviously, it's brought to you. Thank you very much for inviting me, um, uh, Simon, uh, as well as obviously Scandex. Um, and so I just want to say thank you very much. I think what I'm going to do here is just kick off, give you a moment to view the disclaimer. While you're doing that, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So. I'm based in the city of London, uh, or I'm based in London, and uh, I trade regulated funds for two funds in particular. Um, I am a swing trader for a number of different reasons, and, and it's it's every time I hear or say the word swing, I, I can't help but kind of associate it with other stuff. Um, it's, that's the kind of world we live in these days. But yeah, as a I, the reason I tend to trade the higher time frames is really time. Uh, I really really don't want to spend eight hours a day chasing 50 different charts looking for entries whereas i find that if all i have to do is look at the daily chart or perhaps the four hour chart then i can identify if there's a setup or not a lot faster and then i can just move on if that uh, if uh, if there isn't anything there um, and i think also what distinguishes to me what what kind of really settled my trading so i I moved to the UK in 2008 and I kind of started, I think I did what everyone does. I sort of opened up a demo account and back then they were kind of learn, learn Forex trading. And I kind of, and then eventually I made the decision to invest money in education. So uh, I went and paid a lot of money for a lot of money for, um, for what I think was kind of mediocre education. While I was doing that, I then was randomly introduced to Nick McDonald, who had founded a company called Trade With Precision. He was an ex Citibank trader now working out of New Zealand. And I ended up adopting a lot of his principles. So while I was doing all this other education, reading all these books, watching all these videos, devouring as much information as I could, subscribing to all these forums and just kind of what I think everyone here can relate to, I would just keep watching his weekly newsletter and uh, he was just bang on every all the time. I don't think he was ever, ever off. And it was really because of his ability to read price action. Um, but also he, the, the so what really happened was that I was able to witness what I thought trading really should be like, um, as opposed to it always being a flashy signal or, um, or kind of being this smoky, misty, I can't put my kind of like quicksand where you can't really settle on what is trading, you know, how do we really go about doing it? And then it always seems to be a sales pitch and it always seemed very confusing to me. And so when I was watching Nick's stuff, he would, he, everything seemed rational and logical and evidence-based to me. And uh, so I had a bit of spare cash as well. At the time I was already trading, I was probably break even profitable, um, but I had a, some bad habits. I would kind of make, do, I would behave well, be disciplined, then, you know, make money and then take a punt kind of relax and then gamble a bit and so it was it was just i was just a little bit all over the place and i knew so many different strategies i was counter trend trading and range trading 
And so what I made the decision to do was uh, he approached me and said, look, if you want to do my program, go ahead and do it. So I paid some cash, did it, even though at that time I was kind of reluctant to spend more money on education. But it, in hindsight, it was the best thing that I ever did. And so almost immediately my trading improved. And it was because, first of all, uh, the decision was made to only trade with the trend. So only to trade with the trend, no counter trend trading, no range based trading. Um, and that immediately eliminated a lot of charts that were confusing and took time that I was spending a lot of time on. Also, the approach would be to trade every market. So any market, any time frame. but the rule is that it has to be trending. So when we go to the live market in a moment, I'm gonna run through the charts, run through some pairs, and then we'll see what is trending, what isn't trending. Um, and so uh, looking at the presentation now, the goal is really to be focusing predominantly. If I could go back in time and give myself advice, I would say, look, Adam, you know, for your first six months, while you're just getting used to the language, to the platform, to calculating risk, to kind of focusing on things, focus on the maybe only trade the four hour and the daily. You're going to make the same amount of money, but you're probably going to make even more money because the markets will not be as volatile. They will not be moving as fast. So it won't be as confusing. And uh, and so there are a lot of other little benefits. So basically swing trading technically or by definition is trading on the four hour or the daily time frames. Uh, then what I got to do is because I'm only looking at trending markets, my pattern recognition part of my brain uh, was able to now focus on just one thing at one time. Uh, and then of course I had one or two strategies and the, the rationale is much more sensible. Now it's okay, now that you know what a trend looks like, now all you have to do is find an entry into that trend. So first of all, it was about understanding what to avoid. What what are the charts that uh, will have money making opportunities in them? So we either have an uptrend or we have a downtrend. These have money making opportunities. I must only trade in the direction of that. Sounds really simple and logical. You'd be amazed how most people don't do that. Uh, if the market is mixing up its highs and lows, then it is range bound and there's about a 60% to 70% chance I'll lose money if I participate in that market at all. And by the way, if the daily is doing that, that means the same. So even if I'm trading the five minutes, if the daily is range bound like this, there is no reason um, to be getting involved in that at all. So Simon, can I just confirm with you that you can see the slides that my camera isn't interfering with what you're seeing on the slides? It's, it's going fine for me. And um, okay, let me actually just see what you guys yeah. can see. Yeah, uh, all this okay, fine. fine. Nobody reporting any issues, so all good. All right, so, so the first thing is learning how to identify where the money making opportunities are. So that's, that's, and this is something that I still don't see really. I mean, it still seems to be largely just the f a few of us that do this. Um, it's not as common as I would have thought, but to me, it's so rational. Once I've found a nice trend, then the objective becomes finding an entry. How do I go about joining that trend? So swing trading would be focused predominantly only on trending markets. I would focus on the higher time frames, the four hour and the daily. Then I can proceed to master technical analysis and mastering one or two strategies, which are really just written descriptions of a visual pattern that occurs on the chart that has a greater chance of unfolding in our favor or unfolding in a certain way than it does in another way. All right. And that's it, it's just a written description of a visual pattern. But it must include an entry, a stop loss, and a take profit rules for those. Um, then I focus only on trending markets. I keep a journal, which I'll show you as well. Uh, obviously connect, connecting with a mentor, we'll talk about that, but that's not really relevant immediately. And what I loved about this was it allows me to ignore the low and medium impact and social media news. Just, just is stuff that I don't have to worry about. The other thing that I think we need to understand is the difference between investing and trading. So trading, what makes trading unique is that it has an exit point. This is very important. There is a point at which we are definitely 100% going to exit that trade. With investing, we may not ever end an investment. We may wish to stay and hold those stocks or own those shares indefinitely because they may continue to increase in value and yield dividends. But as traders, we have an entry point and we have an exit point and there is a lifespan to that trade. And that is a very important distinction. Um, then, uh, also we are focused much more on what is happening today and this week, much more shorter term focus. We do not need to know why the market is doing what it's doing. We only need to know which way it's going. If it's trending or not trending, we, it doesn't matter why it's doing what it's doing. So a lot of people feel they need to have 
they need to attach meaning to why the chart does what it does. They don't need to, but they feel they need to, and that actually is does not assist us in our technical trading. Um, and so technical trading is the best way to trade the markets in a shorter term time frame um, because it's looking for very clear signals that offer an immediate money-making opportunity or potential money-making opportunity. So what is our goal as traders? Our, uh, we want the ability to earn a primary or secondary income by trading the financial markets. Um, we only need to do try to find two to five trades per week, yielding a net profit of 1%. So that, that what that's meant to do, first of all, is that's that's all I have to do. If there's more opportunities, I'll take more opportunities, but there's no pressure. So the goal here is really to give newer traders a definition of, well, how many trades should I be taking per week? And maybe it won't happen on the Monday, but if you know that all you're really looking to do is do two to five trades per week, which could compound you up to 5% per month, which is fantastic, which is very achievable, uh, then suddenly the pressure's off. If I can't find anything, then maybe today is not the day. And that happens. Mondays can be funny, Fridays can be funny. Um, so Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays can often be the days where things happen. Then I need consistent application of strategy, All right? So in other words, I need to understand my strategy. I need to understand the market weather conditions, the, the best market conditions or the market conditions that will give my strategy the best chance of success or the best chance of making good profits. Uh, proper qualification of trade setups, meaning that the ability to qualify a setup, to look at it and go, this is a good setup, it's a strong setup. Consistent trade management, right? So not changing, not changing strategies, not changing horses mid-race kind of thing, and consistent behavior on our part. Uh, the markets don't know we exist, they don't care about us, we don't matter to them. Um, uh, what And all we are doing, and we actually don't care about that, what we are looking for are market conditions that offer us a potential money-making opportunity, we then choose to participate in the market, and there'll be a point at which we get in, there's a point at which we take profit, there's a point at which we get out, either by our choice or not by our choice. So our goal as traders, as I said, is to identify patterns that have a much greater probability of unfolding in our favor than going against us. So then I also thought I would go through a few things that what a lot of newer traders think are important or that things that drive the market but actually don't matter to traders. Um, things like the instrument to market you're trading isn't important. It doesn't matter what you're trading. It doesn't matter what time frame you're trading. What does matter, we'll get to that in, in a moment, but what does matter more than anything else, absolutely more than anything else, are the, are the market conditions. Is it choppy? Is it volatile? Is it not going anywhere? Or does it have a strong clear trend? Uh, it doesn't matter what other traders say. It doesn't matter what other people are investing in. Uh, Twitter doesn't matter. Any article by Goldman Sachs, hedge funds, Barclays banks, anything that you find online means nothing. Uh, political drama doesn't mean anything. Opinions on forums don't mean anything. All right, those are the things that you can find out the easy way or the hard way. They will never really get you where you want to go. You will find that in the long run, they feel like they add value, but they really don't. Um, you can go and look at a chart and determine for yourself in isolation if there's a money-making money opportunity there or not. So I like, love this quote from Warren Buffett, who uh, one of my idols. Um, there seems to be some perverse human characteristic that loves to make things easy, things difficult. Right? And that's certainly something that happens here. So what does matter? Central bank interest rates is the single biggest mover of currencies. Right? Money flowing from one high interest to low interest or from low interest to high interest, that's it. Um, and that happens year in and year out. What happens today, not really so important, but year in and year out, the big money will be moving it back and forth that way. Liquidity is very important. Execution speed and reliability. Behaving like a trader, not an investor. Most people do that. They get in and then they move their stop loss because now they've decided, well, I think in the long run, it's gonna go up. And so their decision-making processes have switched from this was a short-term setup to now, well, I'm, I'm gonna take a longer-term view on it. And then they expose themselves to more risk and then their thinking changes and their behavior changes and then the results go south. Economic calendar news events are important only so far as in how could this economic calendar event, such as non-farm payroll or interest rates or PMI uh, numbers or um, housing sales, how could this impact a trend that I have that I'm in or that I'm looking at taking a trade in terms of disruption? Um, elections are very important. They can really disrupt the market price levels, key price levels, Fibonacci and perfect levels. These are kind of proven reliable systems. So what should a healthy beginner trader kind of results look like? Well, assuming that this individual 
has uh, has at least got a fixed strategy that they understand that they need to practice and try to understand and they're still working on their um, ability to read price action so usually what would happen out of this i've got a spreadsheet that i've created and i've used in it imagine that you have a strategy where you risk no more than one percent per trade it has a 60 percent win ratio meaning that on average it'll win 60 percent out of every tra 100 trades you take or six out of ten trades uh, and imagine that it has an average realistic expectation of making you three to one reward to risk this is so this is to give you a sense of this now one of the big things most people make the mistake of assuming is that you only have winning trades and losing trades but in the real world in practical trading you can have partial losses break evens and partial wins so in this case assuming we have a beginner who is taking 10 trades and risking one percent maximum and average win really good win is three to one now you might have a four to one win or a five to one win but i'm focusing only on three to one wins here in this case maybe they have one they get right they have a partial win which is either you know one to one or two to one so they make one percent or two percent on their trade maybe they have a break-even trade where they got to one to one and then the market came back and stopped them out and then maybe the rest are losing trades so they're down give or take 3.7 percent okay they're down so the reason I'm showing you this is because I want to highlight that understanding your strategy and market uh, and risk management and uh, uh, technical analysis, the ability to read price action, that's all important. None of the, they're all equally important. But what doesn't get enough appreciation is trade management. When we manage our trades, we treat each trade as like an egg that we have to kind of look after. Uh, it can transform our results. Okay, so what happens is when you get a professional trader, for example, they might only get two full winning trades, meaning two of their trades. I'm going to show you the difference here. Two full winning trades that go three to one, not even more than that. I haven't even included that in. So I'm going quite conservative here, but they have three partial wins. In this case, I've given them, you know, 0.3% per win. So they've had three trades where they bank some money, and then they've had, say, two break even trades where they didn't make money, they didn't lose money, and maybe there was another trade where they managed to move their stop a bit closer, but then they got stopped up, so they had a partial loss. And that difference means they're now up positive 4.5%. So the real magic here is really the trade management, getting some money, break-evens, reducing our losses and banking some money rather than nothing, and of course the full wins make a big difference there. But this would be perfectly acceptable. If this was something that you could achieve every 10 trades on average, you would qualify as a successful trader and that would only mean that you have two full winning trades on that one so um the point being is that it actually takes less than you think it does but also that more attention must be paid more respect more deference should be given to the trade management process meaning well for me for example i'm always taking half profit at one to one always 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 taking profit at one to one um then potentially considering a trailing stop strategy and potentially eyeing out what is your potential, maybe exiting the trades at three to one on average. Excuse me. So this, I kind of got to that place because I, I mean, when I'm trading large accounts where there's millions on the line in total, but you may be risking, I don't know, you've got a hundred grand in open trades, uh, you know, and you lose, and then you have a couple of trades that close out and you're down, you know, per trade is 20 grand down or something on a single trade. That's a lot of money and after a while you kind of find out where is your where's your psychological comfort space where you can say okay i'm comfortable with that so for me what i mean by that is if i have five or six open trades some of those might be losers so they stop out first they tend to stop out first because they hit their stop loss first whereas the other ones are still in profit because the market's moving so mine might hit if i take a daily trade i might get stopped out on a stock within one or two days but the winning trades would then run maybe for four or five days or maybe into into the end of the next week. Um, so then I have that profit and I'm trying to kind of capture it with a trading stop as an example. Um, so it's annoying to have the losing trades, it's never fun, but also I'm my mental uh, balance, my kind of happy space is that I still have open profitable trades and therefore I can keep my, you've, the, the goal when you're managing, especially when you're managing money professionally is to keep your, to find an equilibrium so that taking a, a kick to the nuts to use an expression doesn't take you out of the game entirely you're like okay that's fine because i and you can rebound from it psychologically speaking as well so what is real trading like well understanding the difference between swing trading day trading and position trading choosing the market don't let it choose you in other words don't look at a chart like euro dollar and go okay well i've got to squeeze a trade out of euro dollar because 
tight spreads and it's popular and blah 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 as opposed to the fact that you look at it and you go this is trending beautifully this is definitely got money making opportunities on it identify high probability setups apply risk consistently because even if we have 10 great setups statistically not all of those might win and we don't know how much profit each one will make one might make two to one the other might make four to one we can't predict that so we have to apply risk equally amongst them uh, managing open trades of course reducing risk and exposure as quickly as we can professional approaches habits and psychology and of course reviewing our trades and feedback just note that the markets have no power over you or control uh, they have no expectation of your behavior and no regard for your welfare that's not personal they're not going out to pick on you they don't know you exist okay so swing or end of day trading characteristics are trading the four hour daily or weekly for example to loose generalization um, we would trade smaller candles if we can so if you look at this chart on the right hand side and my entries generally would be my entry and stop loss would be usually on either side of a specific candle and therefore the smaller the candle the tighter my entry and stop loss is within reason and therefore the sooner i can get to the better my reward to risk ratio and the sooner i can get to one to one and break even um so because i'm always focused on trading trends i'm almost always going to make some money usually um, and that's something because i've been doing it for a while now so that is my reality um and so i don't have that i've passed the point a few years ago where i still had doubts about stuff now i know if i just do this i'll make money um I only have to check or manage the trades once a day or something like that, not very often. I don't watch the charts throughout the day unless waiting for an entry on the four hour. Then I only have to look at it every four hours to see what it's how it's closing out or if the candle has got to a level where I want to enter. Um, it's got less volatility, it's less stress, less time in front of screen, maybe 15, 60 minutes per day. Day trading uh, now means if I'm done at the five minute, 15 minute, 30 minute, one hour, four hour. This is a trap for beginner traders uh, because it makes you think that the money making opportunities are all on the five minutes and the five minutes is the key to success not at all it's very volatile you can have an uptrend downtrend sideways markets all within a few hours um and really big moves and you can get exposed to risk if there's a gap i mean so it's it's if i could go back in time i would just tell myself not to go near it for the first six months while i'm mastering everything else but i think it's a trap for beginner traders anyway so you have to then monitor your trades quite a bit because you might have to sit in front of your chart waiting for every candle to close so that you can maybe determine where your entry is and manage it as well. You have to be aware of what market news is happening. There's increased volatility, uh, news coming out can spike the market quite aggressively. So it can be more time consuming and stressful, and it could be up to one or four hours, maybe even a whole day. And that just fries your brain as well. Um, position trading, which is uh, actually not mentioned too often. This is really somewhere in between. This is when you've determined the direction of the market. So you've already determined it's on the daily and the four hourly. What you're looking for now is just a better entry. So instead of maybe getting in on the four hour, I might be able to get in on the 15 minutes on this one single trade. Maybe my other trade is gonna be getting in on the four hour, but it's because I can get a better entry in there. And that would be because there's a, there's a significant pattern that is forming where I can go down to the lower time frames and get in. So an example that is a real trade I took earlier this year, which was an oil uh, breakout. So I was looking to trade down oil. It was actually during, this period here, I'm trying to think it was here or something. It was one of these two, I forget now. Um, and I went down to the four hour, it looked really good. That's right, I think it was something like this. There we go. And uh, so it might even have been this patch here. And this was a really nice flat level breakout, which actually set up here, which allowed me to put my entry below that flat level. And I think my stop loss, I had one stop loss here and another stop loss here. So I split my order in two. I had two half a percent with a tighter stop loss and another half a percent with a slightly wider stop loss. Uh, and then I had an entry here. And then as they and then they triggered it. And that was like, an, I made something like 11 to one on that. It was great. Um, I didn't expect it to move that far. So I don't think the traders can predict consistently how far a move is going to go. It could be a small move, could be a big move. Um, generally, the next key level on monthly, weekly, and daily will give us a good indication of how much room the market has to go. Um, but sometimes it'll, you know, the market could do a very big single aggressive move, and I think that's very difficult to predict. So something that we want to be aware of is where are we in our trading self-awareness? Um, and this is a great example of it. So initially, our intuition is way off. We have to retrain it. Our instincts um, coming from outside trading, non-trading instincts are terrible when we try to apply them to trading. Uh, they don't work at all. And so we have to rebuild them. Uh, we have to rebuild our intuition by 
just just over time this will happen we'll teach it the right thing and then after a while our instincts will start to correct and we'll start to we'll start to have accurate instincts on this initially we don't really know what we don't know then we progress to a point where we suddenly realize holy cow there's a knowledge gap then we can work on that and then what happens is we start to see results ideally we still have moments where we have doubts um, but there's certainly a point where we start to uh, start to realize we're looking at a setup we know it's good we can't maybe can't break down why but it looks good and so that's when we start to achieve unconscious competence so i can look at it at a chart for less than a second easily less than a second half a second or let's just glance at it and i know if there's setups there or not so it's quick and easy um excuse me and this your brain will eventually be able to do that so what is trading Trading is just execution. Just understand that trading itself is just execution of a management of trades. A trading strategy, as I said, is a written description of a visual pattern. And a standard trading plan should be made up of at least two parts. All right, the strategies and the risk management approach for you for that. You need to decide initially. You can obviously copy the general, you know, 1% per trade and employ stop loss and take profit one to one and then look for three to one trades. Those are kind of universal approaches to trading and risk management and then over time you could say all right i'm just going to take profit at two to one and i'm always and maybe i'm just going to go stop loss and two to one targets and then no more and then i'm out so that could be your personal approach you might say you know what i'm never going to risk more than i'm going to start or i'm going to risk two percent per trade and that's it so what is missing from the above so trading really is execution it just means you open an order ticket you put your entry in your stop loss your take profit for example and and that's the that's the actual process of trading but what it doesn't include is the skill so the trading part doesn't really isn't really a skill that's required it's it's pretty quick you can master it within a day the stuff that requires time and effort and that you build up over time where your ear has to learn or your eyes have to learn to feel the rhythm and see the rhythm is technical analysis all right so that is mastering the ability to read and understand price action and its context within the larger picture its context is very important so technical analysis relies on identifying key levels and then reading the body language of recent price action behavior. We want to focus really on somewhere between the last 20 to 40 candles. And then of course, what, what is the story that's going on between the most recent 10 to 20 to 40 candles within the last 60 to 100. So everything else other than price action itself and levels is decorative. That's it. That's the core stuff that we need to know. So in order of importance, trends in price action structure is the most important information we must be able to master. The sooner you get comfortable with taking everything off your chart and just looking at horizontal levels and price action, the sooner you will start to pick up reading price action because your brain is not being distracted by Bollinger Bands and trend lines and moving averages and all kinds of other stuff. Order flow and higher timeframes, that's really just talking about the flow of price in the bigger picture. Price levels, horizontal levels, and price action and candlesticks. These are all pretty much the same things. That's the core stuff that ultimately you will progress towards doing it. But the sooner you get comfortable, even if just for a day, you take everything else off and just look at key levels and price action, the sooner you will start to really develop that skill. Generally unreliable tools and techniques, things to consider avoiding. So I don't mean to offend anyone. We've had some amazingly talented speakers before me. I realize I'm, I'm at the tail end of the caboose. Um, and so I don't mean to offend anyone. So this is a more like my personal opinion. And uh, absolutely, uh, I'm trying, as I said, um, I, I'm going to suggest, I'm putting forward what is my kind of opinion. But if you disagree with it and you find that something I've mentioned here that I don't think is really reliable enough, but you find that it works for you, absolutely. And that's actually all that really matters. I'm just giving you some time here. What I'm trying to do is propose things that I think are not as important as people that we can survive just fine without them. So for example, oversold and overbought, right? This is a common thing about reading RSI or MACD, believing that we we should make trading decisions based on the indicator going into oversold or overbought territory. It's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible way to do it. Um, so we usually avoid doing that because I'm looking for techniques that give me a 90% accuracy or higher. And these are more like 50-50. They're just, I've never really been convinced by anyone that they are that reliable. Sentiment indicators, moving averages as support and resistance is not a big deal. I see the interaction with price on these moving averages. I see it. I see price working within a channel on trend lines, but I don't use them that much. Uh, moving average crossovers is, is usually lagging behind price. So a downtrend in price changing into an uptrend, the, 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 the point at which the moving averages crossover can be 
much later and you can miss out on the best moves. Uh, Bollinger Bands, see the thing is when you're trend-based trading, the Bollinger Bands are more like the outer edges of the move. Um, and so Bollinger Bands are very popular when we're doing reversion to the mean trading. But I avoid reversion to the mean because it's more profitable for me to do the opposite of that, which is trading from the, the center of the value of price outwards in the direction of the trend. So that's why, that's the explanation as to why I say trend lines, trading the news. Trading the news, I, I just don't know that many people who trade. Most people who I know trade the news, lose money. So that's the logic there. Technical skills. Okay, so the single most important technical factor that must be present if you're going to be a technical trader. The market conditions are the primary consideration for making money opportunities. See the chart on the right, you can see the price action is on top of the moving averages and it's generally actually quite messy. I want to be focusing on charts like the one below where price is either above the moving averages, bouncing above it, or in a downtrend, bouncing below it. Um, this is where money making opportunities are. This is where there's a lot more unpredictability because logically there are not one side is not in control over the other. Buyers and sellers are pushing and pulling and therefore the market is unpredictable and the odds of losing money in these situations is very high. So uh, then, this is another one as well. So regardless of the time frame the trader wants to trade, they must qualify the daily time frames conditions first. I don't care if you want to trade the five minutes, you need to know what is going on in the daily. Um, because if the daily is going nowhere in this example, all right, that immediately tells me that the lower time frames are choppy and there's nothing there. So there's just no money making opportunities. And just by looking at one chart, even if I trade the five minutes or the 30 minutes, I can tell that there are no money making opportunities. On, I can move on. So statistically, trades taken against the daily trend tend to lose more often. That's like a 60% chance you're going to lose money if you take a trade on the daily when you really shouldn't be. Most traders, if not all professional traders, will look at the daily chart, regardless of whatever time frame they trade. Um, and ultimately, trading charts with a strong daily trend have a greater statistical probability of yielding profits. Even if the trader is intending to enter on a 15-minute chart, for example, he or she will have a clear idea of the daily time frame's conditions. So um, if we look at a chart, for example, during this period, you can see if the daily is going nowhere, we can also see if we look down on the lower time frame, it's incredibly volatile. Um, there's something else I was going to add to it, but I'll leave that out for now. So we can choose what type of market we want to participate in. It doesn't matter if I'm trading gold or I'm trading bonds. So if I'm trading the US, uh, you know, five-year bond, or if I'm trading the, the uh, if I'm trading platinum, if I'm trading a cryptocurrency, um, I can. There's an option. I can look at it and determine immediately if I should stay away or not. So again, it can't be emphasized enough. The daily charts is the single most important shouldn't be chat, it should be chopped out followers for the spelling typo there. But here, if I've got a really strong trend at the moment on the daily, this is what that one hour looks like. And it's beautiful in terms of that. It's got a very clear direction. And that's all because I can see the daily. And actually here, it's doing the same thing. To the upside, it'll be doing the same thing. So that's where I really want to be focused on that. Um, and newer traders will want to build their confidence in this area by recognizing good daily market conditions. And again, it doesn't matter whether we're doing Forex or stocks, for example. Then we have to focus on price levels, support and resistance. These are the horizontal levels. And what happens with these is that if we remove the uh, moving averages temporarily and we just look at price on the monthly and weekly and daily timeframes, let's say, for example, on the monthly and, and weekly initially, there should be key turning points where price has actually changed direction. And those levels will be permanent going forwards into the future. Once we can identify those levels, especially levels that have been connected with from both above and below, those are very significant levels to the market. When we can identify those, what we're actually doing now is organizing the market into, we're, we're kind of into brackets of price. And once the price breaks through one level, it's now very likely to continue down to the next level. And so traders will operate between these key levels. This is really where the money making opportunities are for us. When price goes down to that next level, it tells me if I get in here, it tells me where I can get in, where I can put my stop loss, where I can potentially, what the potential profit is on that trade. And so this is where the meat on the bone is for us. And so identifying those levels is key. We only need two or three levels above and below where price is currently. So we need to focus, if that is where price is now on the daily, I only need one or two above and below. Where are those next key levels? I don't have to have too many levels on. And that'll be the weekly or monthly levels that are quite significant. 
pivot levels. So in other words, let's just say that I go down to the 15 minutes. I don't I can use pivot levels. They're actually incredibly reliable um, as support and resistance on the much lower time frame. So I can have the monthly and weekly and daily levels and then go down to the five minutes or the 15 minutes or 30 minutes and if I wanted to do that. And it, where I have those uh, support levels, I could see those. So kind of what do we use? What Kind of what's the way to set up a chart and keep it pretty straightforward? Uh, the way that I do it, if anyone is interested, is literally, you know, I can do a 50, 20, and 10, or a 50, 21, and 8. They're so close to each other, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. I can use simple exponential moving averages. Then I throw in an RSI and MACD. I use two of them as uh, a double confirmation. Basically, I could use stochastics, I could use CCI, I could use Williams percent R, but I want to use two of them really as a double confirmation. And if this, what I see on the chart, is price over time these indicators measure speed over time so basically they look at the momentum of or at the speed at which the market is moving relative to how it was moving and so they're a very good indication that if the market is starting to slow down they will start to deviate away from price and we call that divergence so that's predominantly the way it is and the way it is is that if i'm driving my car and i look through my windscreen that's what I see on the chart. Okay, so the most important information I need to navigate other pedestrians, other cars, stop signs, traffic lights, roundabouts, so on and so forth, uh, is what I see through the charts. When I look down at my dashboard, and if I look at my speedometer or my petrol gauge, that's these two indicators here. So I can drive my car if I have to without looking down at my dashboard, but I absolutely cannot make crucial driving decisions if my windows are blacked out and all I have to guide me is my petrol gauge and my speedometer. Copy that. This is recommended reading. You might want to screen grab this. Uh, these are the books I recommend as the bare minimum, Trading in the Zone and the Discipline of Trader by Mark Douglas. If you have not heard of these, these are absolutely required reading. Jack Schrager's Market Wizards are also very powerful because he interviews, he's doing this, he's doing another book right now. Um, and he does one about every 10 years and then he interviews a variety of traders from all walks of life. And I know that this came up earlier because I've been sitting in on some of the presenters today. Um, so these are really good. The Complete Turtle Trader, if you ever saw um, trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, that movie was inspired by this story. Okay, so you want to read that as well. What it will confirm for you is that you could take people from all walks of life, and if you gave them a strategy and they could stick to the strategy, they'd be successful, which proves that it can be done if they just understood what it was they had to look for and, what, and manage the trades that way. All right, so patient, we talk about, you hear about discipline a lot with traders. Um, Patience is a, is a factor. Patience with yourself, understanding that sometimes you're going to have to wait for a trade to set up. You might have missed it, and now you have to wait again. And so it's the discipline of patience as a, as a it's a big factor. Discipline is is not really uh, it doesn't play a factor as often as once we understand why we have to do certain things. It's not discipline isn't required because it just becomes common sense. Um, but certainly patience is a factor, I believe. Trade what you see, technical analysis, great. This one's phenomenal. So Reminiscences of a Stock Operator by Jesse Livermore traded the, he shorted the 1929 stock crash. He saw it coming, he benefited from it, and that happened almost 100 years ago. And when you read the book and he talks about the markets and the people, it, it could be here, it could have been written today. And uh, so again, that's confirmation that the market is pretty much the same today as it was then. And therefore, our obsession with why the market is doing what it's doing today is not really as important as we think it is. The Intelligent Investor, absolutely everybody, everybody should read this or buy the audiobook. You know, get the audiobook, certainly for reminiscences of a stock operator, audiobook is good. Intelligent Investors, an audiobook is fine. Trading in the Zone, audiobook is fine. Um, market Wizards, audiobook is good. Complete Turtle Trader audiobook, yeah, trade what you see, you'll need images, you'll need visuals, so you need the book. Um, so Benjamin Graham, and uh, he was Warren Buffett's lecturer at university, Warren Buffett read the book and then actually managed to get him as his university lecturer. And basically the result has been Warren Buffett's success as a result of this book. Common sense, and uh, but it is, again, it's more investing than trading. So, right, let's do this as well. I'll come back to this in a moment. I want to go and have a look at the markets. And uh, so let's just do that. Let's go through and have a look. I'm going to use Pro Real Time for the purposes of today. 
uh, just to show you the chart we use it doesn't matter the platform we don't use find whatever works for you um, that is fast and easy for you to use and intuitive so whether as we said that c trader or whichever one that you want to use there are lots of great platforms out there i've seen the list that we have and they're all they're all really really good so the, the platform itself per se uh is what we want from that is nice crystal clear cut pricing now, obviously, we want that to be the case, and that is a fact that all the platforms that I've seen that um, that are offered here are very high quality. So that's there's no there's no um, no doubt in all of that. But what I wanted to do was demonstrate to you. So what I've got here is I've I've split up my time frames uh, in from the daily on the bottom right to the four hour to the one hour to the thirty minutes and fifty minutes. So the reason this is really important for newer traders to do, or if you're struggling to achieve consistency in your trading is that our brains initially can have trouble extrapolating, um, trying to connect with what we're seeing on the higher time frames with what's happening on the lower time frames. The, our brain struggles to make that connection to kind of time slice it down. So initially we need about six to eight breakdowns from the daily right down uh, to maybe the 15 minute, for example. And that will, what will happen very quickly within like a week or two, our brain will start to be able to look at the four hour and our brain will intuitively know what the one hour or 30 minute looks like. And that all happens because we slice it up this way. And eventually you go from maybe um, eight or six windows down to maybe four, and then maybe down to three. Um, and so I've got different layouts when I do that. But for intraday trading, I quite like this. And so what I'm looking for, if I go through the market, so on the left-hand side, I've created a watch list of the most, my go-to list of currencies, my go-to list of indices um, and commodities. And so, for example, what I like about this is almost immediately I can see we've got a nice bullish trend to the upside on the 30 minutes and on the 15 minutes and an uptrend on the one hour and technically also an uptrend on the four hour. The daily has no clear trend, right? So let's go and have a look at NASDAQ, which is the most bullish one of the bunch. That looks really good. It's looking really nice and bullish. It is struggling with 10,000 as a big level at the moment. Um, and But overall, in terms of trading opportunities, so although I do swing trade a lot on the funds on my own account, I'm quite, ha quite happy to also do intraday trading. Um, and again, the earnings are roughly the same. I don't necessarily make more on the intraday stuff. End of day stuff is fantastic when I go on holiday. I only have to look at the chart literally quarter past 10 um, for about 30, for oh, not even 10 minutes, run through them. There's either a trade setup or there isn't. And then if there is, I place the order and I don't even have to look again until the next day. So for most people you're looking, you want the excitement of interacting with the chart. So swing trading is by comparison, it's boring but not because it doesn't make money, but because it doesn't allow you to play in the markets as much as you want. So just think about that a bit, whether what you're looking for is the excitement and the ability to play in the markets. So just running through a couple of these, um, what are the ones that have been on my watch list? So at the moment, if you just look here, for example, I was talking to you about how the markets are very choppy. It, we're looking here at Euro stocks. And if you look at this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 11 days in a row, it's just been going sideways. So just by looking at the daily, I can see that this is junk. There's just no way to trade this. And there'll be people trading this. They'll be like, yeah, I do this every morning. I just trade it for half an hour. And sometimes I make money, sometimes I lose money. I'm like, well, I'm not surprised because this is a tumble dryer. So there's nothing really there. Let's look at the DAX. Okay, so the DAX between the two, again, just immediately look at this. We've got, you know, five or six or seven or eight or 19 days, nowhere. Uh, Hong Kong, the Hang Seng, this one's heading lower. It's still very choppy in this area, but today, especially if you can break out of this level, you'll start, as soon as you can break outside of a range, it will start to move. Nikai, look at them. And it's not a, it's not an accident that a lot of these have been doing nothing for 10 days. If you, if you look at COVID-19 and its impact in the US and the US economy being the biggest in the world, and you look at the economic uncertainties, you've, it, all of it just ties together and like the markets are just like, well, where do we go, what do we do? Um, and I assure you, there's there's not a lot of people that have information, you don't necessarily do that. A lot of the really big money managers on hedge funds and whatnot are making similar decisions to us. They've got more money and they might have to produce more of a paper trail to justify their decisions on it, but they'll be looking at technicals just as much as they might have researchers internally creating rationalizations for why they should move money here or do certain things here. But generally speaking, they won't, won't get into it. What you see is the sum of transactions in place. 
um, and they're transparent. But as I said, they don't show pending orders out of the way. But I've been doing this long enough that pending orders are irrelevant, really. They, knowing that there are key orders at certain levels is a given. Uh, and the other thing that I think you should also know is that these key levels, these monthly, weekly, and daily key levels, this is where the big fish like to transact because they have greater liquidity at those levels. Because if you want to get in, somebody else has to get out. If you want to get out, somebody else has to get in. And so they transact with each other at those levels. But also remember that the big fish have to trade against the big fish. So don't assume that one side has it completely under control and the market just does what they want. Sometimes they have to, they have different reasons for getting into and out of the market. And sometimes they have to trade against each other and sometimes they lose. So just I'm trying to clarify here the mysticism and the voodoo that you know, there are people out there that know what's going on. It's not, I've just never witnessed that. So I don't, I don't quite buy it. Um, I've seen massive hedge funds lose big money because they got the euro dollar wrong because of Brexit. You know, I've seen it happen. Um, and so it just, to me, that is usually the case. Now, um, the people who've been doing this for a very long time will focus on the markets with the clearest direction of where the market is likely to go and be cautious in areas where it isn't, especially as traders. I'm only concerned with what's going on this week. So what's going on? Here's the US dollar basket. What's going on with that? Well, if I look at it, it's on the daily. It's a little bit of an uptrend, but actually, honestly, it's pretty much range bound. If I just go ahead, I can just bracket this here. This is where we are at the moment. Market really doesn't know what it wants to do. The problem with this is this impacts the euro dollar immediately. Okay, so the euro dollar is also not really going anywhere at this point in time. Sterling, um, although it is in a downtrend, it's going down a couple of days, up a day, down a couple of days, up a couple of days. It's just very messy. I'm looking for stuff with a little bit more of a sustainable trend. And uh, dollar yen, for example, is one of the worst currencies to trade, and a lot of people think it's a fantastic deal. And actually, if you go look at it on a monthly basis, you will see that it has been largely range bound, even going back to 2016, stuck within this range. So dollar yen is, as a, in my opinion, my personal opinion, of course, is just a waste of money. And dollar Swissy, you can see as well, monthly, not really going anywhere. It's generally weakening, so there are shorter term opportunities on it, but so next, let's go and have a look at Euro GBP. Beautiful, this is good. So there's some really good shorting opportunities here at the moment today, lower timeframes. Um, it's also at the top of a range, but what I like is the chart structure here as well. And uh, your Aussie looking at a couple of these. Do you see that there's a bit of a correlation here? Euro GBP dropping down, look at this chart here. Euro GBP, Euro Aussie, Euro Kiwi, right? Very very bearish. So the common element there is obviously the euro dollar and uh, euro yen, not so much, and euro swissy. So generally speaking, most of the euro charts are heading lower. So that implies a weaker euro, euro cat as well. Okay, so if I was going to take a position, and this is just a horrible chart, uh, if I was going to do that, uh, I mean, that's just insane. Um, I would go short if I was going to. But knowing that the bigger picture, that as soon as I start to zoom out, the bigger picture is like a tumble dryer, then I'd be very quick to take profits. So in other words, then what happens is my take profit strategy and my risk awareness goes up. I know that I'm getting into something where the daily is very choppy. And so I want to know where's the top and bottom of the daily range and be very cautious. Pound Aussie, let's have a look at that. Pound Aussie, I mean, now that is a beautiful trend on the daily. It doesn't look so good on the lower time frames, but man, that's what every chart should ideally look like. And it isn't always the case. Pound Kiwi, really good trend. Very cool. Okay, so that's where there'll be some good opportunities on, say, the four hour, even potentially here as we go into the one hour as well. Um, and there'll be moments when we can do that on the lower time frames. Uh, then we have pound yen. Notice both pound yen are climbing and euro yen. So the implication being that Euro Yen was one of the few that bucked the Euro trend. Pound Yen is also climbing. So that implies it's the Japanese Yen. Easy way to do that is to maybe go look at Aussie Yen and Kiwi Yen and see if any of those are climbing as well. So if Aussie Yen is climbing, which it is, it looks almost identical on this time frame, to Pound Yen. Then the moving, that the currency pair that's moving that particular market today is the Japanese Yen. So look at Kiwi Yen, maybe. There we go, same thing again. So the comfort I can take from that is now I have a market that is definitely powering through moving the market. If I trade in the same direction as it, probabilities are that it's going to pay off some money. And obviously I want to, I'm not going to assume that it's going to do that. I'm going to make sure I've got a stop loss in and make sure that I take profit off the table as it does that. By the way, everything that I'm telling about now, you can actually, can be transferred to the day. So in other words, all of this is still the same 
approach to swing trading. I'm looking at the weekly and the monthly instead of the daily and the four hourly. I'm just looking higher up the chain to make sure that everything is going in the same direction. So uh, let's have a look at this as well. So GBP CAD, just not much. When you get to a great chart, you'll see that almost all of them will just be going up together or down together, and then that's where the money is. And remember that I only need to take two to five trades per week as a basic. I mean, if I see 10 great trades today, I can take them all. There's nothing saying that I shouldn't because trades do not space themselves out or position themselves out equally every day for our convenience. They don't work that way. They, there's days when there's lots of trades and days when there aren't any. The trick in the beginning is starting to realize when there aren't any so that you go, okay, it's not me. I'm not missing something. There isn't a trading opportunity. Um, so what I'm looking at here, and it's not really giving any clarity, is looking at Aussie Swissy for a breakout below that level, but it's just not going anywhere. And this is what's interesting. Most of the charts are not really offering much clarity, most of them. It's like 27 base currencies. Look at this. This is just, I mean, Aussie CAD, that just goes back for like three weeks, nothing. Kiwi Yen, nothing. So if you think lately that you haven't been able to find opportunities or you've experienced a lot of losing trades, that's why. Okay. And again, I don't need to know why. I can see that, that the conditions are a little bit more choppy. Even here, daily. Kiwi Swissy. So almost all these charts are like that. Swissy Yen looks good. So what have, what have I taken away from this so far while I'm going through the charts in front of you? The Yen charts are looking nice. There's some potential here. So although Dollar Yen isn't high on my list, that's because Japan and the USA have a very strong trade relationship. And, uh, and therefore, it's in the Japanese interests to maintain a certain exchange rate because of exports. That's just common sense. And they can do that. Japanese candlesticks, it's not an accident that they know how to trade. They're very good at that. Um, and so they can maintain their exchange rates and they do that on purpose. That's part of their monetary policy. Let's have a look at gold. Gold, okay, so let's, have a, let's take a moment to appreciate gold in all its glory. It's on my watch list. Look at the monthly, uh, monthly chart. So it was trapped. You can't really see this. I'm going to show you something really cool now. I can go and have a look at the quarterly, and I want to show you something really cool. I'm going to go to the yearly. So this is gold on a yearly basis. What it has basically done is it's got this pattern going here. Okay, so it's got it here, then a pullback, then a move up, then a pullback, and it's taking off. All right, so that's all it's really done. It's now starting to head away from the moving averages. It's probably sitting at about that kind of distance away from the moving averages, but yeah. So that's really what is happening there. I go down to the monthly, I zoom out. You can see this area where it was consolidating for a while, broke out through that 1350 level and is taking off now. So it's in a nice uptrend. The key levels, once it broke through that, the next level is pretty much 1790 to 1800. Once it breaks through that, the next level for now is 1900, give or take. So headed away, so extension retracement extension and this is that volatile period during February and March and then it connects with the moving averages and it's headed away. It is now very close to the 1800 level and it is a little overextended from the moving averages. Um, so it is due at some point to come back to the moving averages. It's due for it now. Uh, what I think it wants to do desperately is to connect with 1800. Uh, connect to that and then come back down and come down to the moving averages, or even maybe as far as, as far as sorry, 1550. Um, and so when I go to the weekly, I get a sense of where it could potentially come back to. It's also starting to head away from the moving averages on the weekly. So this, once it taps 1800, it's not unreasonable to think that it could take a breather and come back. Then I go to the daily, and I can see, look, it had this really nice consolidation patch here, broke out of it, came back, tested, resistance as support of a beautiful bullish candle. This is the behavior and now it's breaking up and that's where it wants to go. So what I would like you to do is take away what I just did here. I looked at the monthly. Where is that going? Identify the key levels. I can kind of see how long, how big the cycles are and I can see that it's almost at this very important level. If it could just get to that, you can kind of, that's what it wants to do is travel from one key level to the next level. So it's really wanting to do that. Then I go down to the weekly and I can see that it's doing that same cycle. Then I go to the daily 
and I see a breakout of a consolidation produce a bullish candlestick on top of a previous level of resistance, which all of this adds up what the market is trying to do, right? And then breaks above that follows through, and this is what it's trying to do. It's trying to get to that. So what does that mean for me in terms of intraday opportunities? Well, if I can see some opportunities here, before I get up to the 1800 level, I can take them. But it's high risk. Why is it high risk? Well, because in the run-up to close that gap, there are people that are going to start exiting their big positions because they don't know if it's going to make it to 1800. So they're starting to take some of their profit off the table. They're starting to exit the trade. And so it's losing momentum as it goes. It's a big market. It's like a big Titanic type boat. Can't just turn on a dime. It has to kind of, it has to coordinate the whole thing. So I wanted to show you that. But I also wanted you to understand why gold is likely to go up. Then we've got silver. Silver also looks pretty good. It's not bad. It's also got an extra, another key level here at 1875. Also has an uptrend on the four hour, it looks like that. Let's look at crude oil. So the one big difference between crude oil and gold is this, go to the monthly. What was the monthly trend on gold? It was up. The monthly trend on oil is down. Now it's coming back up into key levels. This is where it is. So it's currently back up into that. It is in a downtrend and therefore in this area, it is also not entirely crazy that it might want to turn around and resume the downtrend. That's a possibility. Of course, there is also the possibility that it's going to break out of that downtrend and then form a new uptrend or whatever. That is a possibility. There are two potential situations there. But if it did start to turn around at this key level and head lower, my brain, if I started seeing that on the four hour, I would know why, because that monthly trend is down and it's in the right area geographically for it to be able to do it. So you can see also why it's struggling at that key level. Why? Because, well, on the monthly, that is a key historical level. And if, we, if it can break through that, yeah, it might make it up to $50. And this is the same for West Texas Intermediate and Brink Crude. It's basically this exact same scenario. If you go look at it on a monthly basis, you've got the same scenario here. Those are your key levels. That's where price is going to go to. So um, there we go on that. Let's have a look at that. So then we can go things like sugar as well, uh, just a couple of other commodities that are really nice. Let's look at Bitcoin. So cryptos, most people don't really get this, but cryptos are basically digital commodities, right? Um, if you imagine you have a nugget of gold in your hand, which is a commodity, uh, and it's worth something, it doesn't matter if it's worth a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks on the open market. It's only when you physically sell it that you get that money. So, you know, if it's a thousand bucks today. And you go in tomorrow, you're like, it's a thousand bucks, I'm going to go sell it. And you go in tomorrow, it's a thousand two hundred or it's eight hundred dollars because it's changed. That's what you're going to get for it. If you lose it, it's gone. If you drop that gold nugget and I don't know, you drop it somewhere on the way to the market to sell it, it's gone. You had it, but it's gone now. It's the same with cryptocurrencies. Also, gold has value because we have given it value. So it's only worth, it's not worth anything to my dog. Um, but it's worth something someone else wants to buy. Cryptos are the same. Cryptos have created their own value as an alternative, effectively, to government oversight. As an alternative to the one percenters, basically, that's the purpose of it. But it's a digital commodity. If I have it on a memory stick, for example, it's only worth what I ultimately sell it to the market for. If I lose it, it's gone. It's the same thing. And are any, either of them only have value because we give them value. One distinct difference might be that you can make something out of gold um, and you can eat it if you're really hungry, I suppose. Um, but yeah, but the point is that principally they're, they're the same. So uh, we, you know, they're here, to set, they're here to stay. There's no reason why they would go anywhere. They're another market to trade. They're very popular. Um, what are they, what's their worth in terms of value? You have to ask yourself the same thing about gold and silver in terms of would I want to physically own it? Do I want to trade it? Remember that the one is investment and requires two to five years, five to 10 years or more in terms of waiting for value. It's a different approach. Trading is what's happening right now. If I look at it right now on the daily, it's not going anywhere. It's got a key level of 10,000 it is really struggling with. Once it breaks through that, that's fine. Then it's gonna head upwards, um, but it's struggling with that at the moment. And right now there are no money making opportunities on this time frame uh, here. So, uh, that is so what am i looking at in terms of trading at the moment well um I, i'm still bullish in principle on the indices but we are in an area where uh the markets could potentially take a breather they could correct on the monthly time frame and we haven't really got out of the that we, we if anything the the COVID 19 issue is becoming worse um and 
the largest economy in the world, which is the US economy, is incredibly, the US right now is going through massive civil unrest. Um, there's no way Trump is going to be reelected. A lot of people are saying there's no way he won't be. He's absolutely out. He's definitely out. Um, the only way he manages to stay in is if he cheats and they're going to physically remove him from the White House at this point. There's like massive civil unrest. Um, and so he's not going to be there anymore. But, and I think at that point, then there'll be some hope and then the markets will find some buoyancy, but we also need a cure for the coronavirus. Um, we also need a cure for it. And then once we have that, then people can know, okay, that's one less thing to worry about. If the US is calming down now and they change the tax rules and all kinds of things are going on. It's just like if we're living in very interesting times and there's a lot right now that's that's going on. So why I'm saying that is because the uncertainty around the US dollar and the US markets can stay this way. Between now and November, we could have a big drop, then we could have a big climb and all kinds of things. We've got a lot of money that is around um, very wealthy people that are buying at the dips. So whenever there's a kind of a big drop, they're buying at a discount. So if you're sitting there going, I don't understand why the market is climbing. When I look out there, most people are really struggling. It's because the people who are buying are not part of the, the larger economy out there. That that was the case 34 years ago when you didn't have billionaires, but now you have billionaires who are not necessarily impacted the same way. So the market is not a true reflection of what's actually happening out on the streets. And so we don't wanna get caught up in that. Um, but the beauty of trading is of course, we can short the market if it's bearish, we can trade it upwards if it's bullish, and we could also use that for investment purposes. So if you wanna have a look at, for example, certain um, certain stocks that are really good. So if we go and have a look at Costco, it's just a fantastic, uh, it's an item list. Let's go look at Costco uh, and look at that on a monthly basis. So why do I like it? Well, because for one thing, um, they, everything is cost effective. So when there's an economic slump, people have to cut their budgets. They buy for the family, they buy everything at a discount, they go to Costco. And so Costco actually does really well during a recession. Waste management, certain other things do incredibly well there. Things that we don't necessarily need might lose value. Um, so it's quite interesting to see that if we go and have a look at a few items, but the world is changing as well. So Simon, um, I'm gonna bring you in at this point. Uh, I've kind of done a bit of a discussion. I feel like I've covered um, lots of core items. Oh, if anyone's interested, just if you are interested in, um, so let me bring up my, from the one fund. So these are the regulated sign off results if you wanted to kind of see what real trading results are. Um, and this is just kind of the last five years. I need to get, I mean, we're now six months into this year, I need to get an updated version of this. And it's just a hassle for me to chase the regulator for it. But anyway, um, and so these are the kind of, these are results here from, from my trading as well. Um, and so I'm not using 1% per trade, I'm using 0.2% per trade or 0.25% per trade. Because a zero, you know, 1% hit on a 12 million account is a lot of money and customers don't wanna see a 1% drop and then a 4% climb, it's too volatile. Whereas if I am going at 0.2% per trade, um, I've got five trades that I can have losing trades before I even have to start stressing before even if 1% down, but my winning trades might make half a percent or maybe even more than that. So that's my comfort zone psychologically and it seems to work really well. So, sorry, Simon, you're in. I'm, I'm here. Absolutely, Adam. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, David says, thanks, Adam. They saved the best till last. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. That's, uh, are there any, um, obviously, any other questions or anything that you may have? Uh, please he also knows the glass, the glass of wine as well, which, which I did. He says, now you can finish that glass of wine. <laughs> yeah. Thankfully, I only started it at the webinar, so I'm still sober. It hasn't really kicked in yet, but yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, yeah, Adam, so, uh, yeah, um, look, I mean, so I guess, because you want to finish, oh, we've got five minutes, but so, let me just, if I may, let me, um, so the, the swing trading should be seen as looking for opportunities on a four hour and daily. Um, it means that my trades will be open anywhere from 24 hours to maybe 10 days. Uh, it also means that I only, I can look, um, I can look at stocks, I can look at commodities, I can look at indices. And I used to, the, the market conditions we're going through now, Generally, I actually allow me to to show you this because I think that uh, it's really worthwhile. So I'll go to a slightly different layout, and uh, I'll just do my monthly, weekly, daily one, and I'll show you like the indices. So if you have a look at a few of these, generally speaking, we tend to have the market climbing very well in the U.S., for example. The last couple of years, it's been incredibly volatile. Um, for a few reasons I won't get into right now because otherwise I feel like I just I get sick of the sound of my own voice. But 
these market conditions for me would usually be my go-to for trading opportunities because the trends look so good and therefore the probabilities of making money are so much higher um, and less stress feet. So my, my go-to in that situation would be uh, certainly to be looking for trading opportunities on those lower time frames. And the market is almost always going to go to the upside. There we go. So we can see on the left-hand side, this is really coming in towards 20, uh, 2018. This is when the trade wars were kind of kicked off, the trade tariffs were kicked off. Um, and they have subsequently basically just screwed Americans because effectively what they did was they imposed tariffs where a lot of US uh, citizens or business people were, were paying greater taxes. And so it's it's almost destroyed some of the farming communities. It's it had a really negative impact. It hasn't really progressed anywhere at this point in time. Up until that point, the market was really nice and happy and healthy. And so if you went and looked for trades on that on the daily and four hourly, your odds of success were very, very high. And that will be the case in the future. Just right now, it's not really the same. But because if you've been learning how to trade in the last year, this would have been 2017, that's three years ago. So you wouldn't even know that that is what it can be like. But that is one reason why I loved the US indices because they could do that. US tech is almost certainly outperforming everything else because we are now a technological society. We used to be industrial. So the Dow was really where a lot of things were focused on. Um, and then, you know, the DAX was always good. I really loved the DAX. It could perform really well. Being in the UK, I started out trading the FTSE because I live in the UK. And it was after a while I realized that I was unconsciously being kind of um, funneled into trading a particular instrument because I thought I should because I lived in that country. When in actual fact, the beauty of trading is that we can choose what we want to trade and what is going to make the money. And if it's if it's if it's the Nifty in India, if it's the JC in South Africa, for example, or whichever currency we want to do, we should have reasons for taking that trade. And it should be because it offers to us a clear money making opportunity. And again, as I said, to take to unburden you from how many trades you feel that you need to be making. Uh, if we go across here to this one, for example, I've got the spreadsheet. I want to show you something else here as well. So I created this for me. Okay, so this wasn't for you guys, this is for me. I thought that if I have, say, five grand in an account and I can throw in 250 bucks a month into that, and I take, let's say, three trades per week or two trades per week, and I risk 1% per trade, and I have a 60% win ratio and a 40% loss ratio on the strategy. So I actually take 40% of my profits away, and I have a two to one profit ratio on this. Um, my compounding plus the money I add in, which is going to be about almost three grand. Is going to get me to about 14,900 within 52 weeks. I and mean, you don't trade from about the 10th of December until about the 8th of January because you just don't. The markets don't do much. So it's not going to be 52 full weeks of uh, trading. But this gave me a guideline as to where I can roughly expect to be. So if I was ahead of it, then I can calm down. But also it tells me that with two trades per week, that's kind of roughly where I can I can get to be. So at first I thought, well, that looks really high. I mean, that's 14,000 from 5,000. That looks ridiculous. So if I then take it to a million pound account or a hundred thousand pound account. I don't add any money to that. I keep it at two trades per week and I drop it down to 0.2%, which I told you I do per trade. It comes out to, I'm roughly in about the 20, if you look at my returns, I'm roughly in the 22, 23%. So this spreadsheet is actually accurate. Um, it's, it's accurate from that respect. Um, and so what that does is it allows, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to take, is to get you to not feel pressure to push yourself or to try to squeeze stuff from the market that the market is not in a position to give you because it's it doesn't it's not offering those opportunities. But at the same time, that if you can find something that you know your strategy, you can identify the market conditions that you need, whether it's range bound or whether it's counter trend or whether it's with the trend. But once you can identify those market conditions, milk it, go for it. Um, <laughs> also understand that every day you sit down at your computer, you should remind yourself because you need self-awareness when you do this. You should remind yourself that today's market conditions can be different from yesterday. So it's a, it's a habit. I know that when I sit down each day that I'm, I'm already in a state of, okay, what's the market going to be like today? But I remember when I was a beginner trader that I was hoping that if I had a good day yesterday, today would do the same thing. And then I'd often find myself giving some of the profits back because the market had changed. So remind yourself that every day you sit down, the market conditions can change. And if they do, you don't take it personally. All right. So... Um, sorry, Simon. Um, back to you. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? No, for the moment, I think uh, most, mostly just positive feedback, Adam. 
cool thank you i have one last thing i want to show you a trading journal um cool. so uh the trading journal here is what i think a proper trading journal should look like so here we go um so the way that i do it is uh it's a, this is a, amazes me because most people do these trading journals and they just do text it's just like a spreadsheet with no visuals but what we're doing is we're trading patterns so for a moment forget about the accounting side of it the financial side of it we are just trading patterns on a screen i could teach a child to play the game um of playing of playing the patterns and then as they get older i could say okay well, let's take some of your pocket money because by now you recognize the patterns and you know oh it's going to go this way it's going to go that way it's not going to go anywhere and then we could put a bit of money on it so that's the approach we should take here and so we want to keep a record of very quick it's got to be two three minutes to fill out what was the time frame so i could send this to somebody else without even talking to them and they would be able to see what i saw and why i took the trade where's my entry my stop loss what's it'll auto calculate that if i set it up one percent risk obviously did it hit one to one in this particular case so i can identify what is this a snapshot what is that trade setup i also include the two higher time frames so if it's the daily i'm taking the trade on i want the weekly and monthly then i snapshot <clears throat> excuse me the outcome so in this particular case, and I color code it, whether it triggered or didn't trigger, or whether it was a break even, or whether it was a one to one, I can color code that. So in this case, for example, Kiwi Dollar has got a really nice downtrend. It's broken through support, coming back up to retest resistance. Um, it might be testing a FIB level or pivots. Those are really reliable. Um, in this case, it's got a nice downtrend on the monthly. Um, and so then I can go ahead and obviously I just say yes, it hit one to one. What was the final banked outcome on that? One and a half percent and so on and so forth. I also snapshot trades I miss. So if for some reason I just somehow missed a trade setup, which I shouldn't have, but I missed it, or I wasn't sure about it, so I didn't want to trade it, and then it turned out to be really profitable. I don't get upset about that. I'll keep a record of it because it then teaches me, it, it improves my pattern recognition brain and my skills, it improves my skills. And so then what I did was I would just pump out the, the results of that. So I could tell what, where I had made money from these batch of trades, so this would be a week, second week of February, and my gross profit was 2.67 that week, um, and it all came from currencies, <clears throat> and then pump those numbers out to the front page, where I can then see, oh, I'm making most of my money from global indices or currencies, um, or per year, for example. I could even set it up so that each year I could see where I'm uh, making more money, or maybe where I'm losing more money. So maybe currencies turn out to be, I'm not making as much money. So either there's a reason why, or I should just drop it. But if there's a reason why I can figure out, maybe they're just not going anywhere. Um, and so I wanted to uh, just show you this, but you can see some of these I can, and I always keep uh, a snapshot of the outcome. And the reason for that is beginner traders, you don't have confidence. You're going on belief now, oh, well, he says the strategy will work, but I don't know if it will. And actually, if you keep, uh, often you might actually find a good trade setup that you, get stopped out of, you get triggered in and stopped out, and then you just walk away from the chart, only to go back later and see that the market has actually gone where you thought it would. So one of the things we have to get away from, take out of this exercise is, were we at least right about the general direction of the market? Did we at least read the price action correctly? Even if we maybe had a small candle followed by an engulfing candle, which can happen. Um, and I, that part's very important for our confidence. We can go, okay, well, I lost money, but it, I was right about the direction. So then it was just down to the individual candlestick that, um, that I got triggered in on. And that's a very important aspect that we want to review on our losing trades because that actually helps with our confidence. Sorry, Simon, so that was all I wanted to throw in here. I wanted to show people who are watching um, what the kind of, you know, the approaches and what, you know, proper trading journal should look like um, and the benefits that you get from that. That's great. I think these spreadsheets are great, um, Adam. They, they, they really do um, a proper job of keeping you on the tracks and letting you know when you're up and down. It's amazing how many people, they do come to these webinars and say, well, I don't know if I've actually made any profit this year or not. So it is uh, yeah. good record keeping. That's great. Uh, email address, um, LinkedIn, all the contact details are there. And uh, anybody that wants to contact Adam, of course, yeah. by email, you can do it I mean, myself. Yeah. Yeah, articles and stuff will get on LinkedIn, but I also record live trades, um, which then get put onto the YouTube channel. So uh, you can, if you want to see, but I'll always rationalize why I'm taking the trade. It'll be on the watch list. And once you've seen what I've just spoken about now, why I'm taking a trade, they will actually make sense to you. So I just, it's kind of, you know, do as I do kind of scenario. Fantastic. 
Well, thank you for being uh, our great ultimate speaker for the two days event. I really appreciate your time and thank you on behalf of everybody else here. Um, uh, it's been a, a privilege to have you come in and thank you for spending the, an evening inside uh, when I know it's nice weather outside. So we will hopefully catch up again soon, Adam, and uh, all the best. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Have a good evening.